in the 1580s, the Italian Jesuit Filippo Sassetti, uh, he noticed something exciting while interacting with the local people in Goa. Uh, he discovered that many words and terms used in European languages had an uncanny similarity with uh, Sanskrit and, of course, many other Indian languages. You know, Dio and Deva for God and Serpent and Sarpa for Snake were also so similar that a connection between Sanskrit and European languages could not but be real. And that was the academic, uh, the beginning of the academic quest for uh, the mythical Indo-European peoples of the prehistoric past and, of course, the, you know, sacred mother language from which came almost all the other classical uh, Indo-European languages like Greek, Farsi, Persian, Latin, and of course, uh, Sanskrit. Uh, good morning, guys, uh, and thanks for coming. So we'll get started. So you know the the topic is little different. Like uh, it's it's I, I mean related to Sanskrit, but I would call it the position of Sanskrit among Indo-European languages, and analysis based on Panini's Ashtadhyayi. So um, I'll get started. So um, in the 1580s, the Italian Jesuit Filippo Sassetti uh, he noticed something exciting while interacting with the local people in Goa. Uh, he discovered that many words and terms used in European languages had an uncanny similarity with uh, Sanskrit and, of course, many other Indian languages. Like, uh, first he figured out seven in Italian was sette and it's sapta in uh, Sanskrit and all Hindi and other languages. Eight was octo and in Sanskrit it was, uh, it, it is ashta. Similarly, uh, you know, dio and deva for god and serpent and sarpa for snake were also so similar that a connection between Sanskrit and European languages could not but be real. And that was the academic, uh, the beginning of the academic quest for uh, the mythical Indo-European peoples of the prehistoric past. And of course, the, you know, sacred mother language from which came almost all the other classical uh, Indo-European languages like Greek, Farsi, Persian, Latin, and of course, uh, Sanskrit. Like towards the middle of 18th century when the first group of uh, Indophiles, I would call, or the Orientalists in India, who uh, figured out that India was much more than a terrain just to be mapped, surveyed, and exploited for natural resources, a fantastic person called William Jones founded the Asiatic Society in Calcutta, modeled after the Royal Society in, in London. And he told, I will just quote from uh, one of his lectures, the bounds of investigations, which is in Royal Society Jones Road, will be the geographical limits of Asia, and within these limits, its inquiries will be extended to whatever is performed by man or produced by nature. And then, in a famous lecture in 1786, I, I will again quote it. He said, Sanskrit language, whatever may be its antiquity, is a wonderful structure, is of a wonderful structure, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either, yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity than could possibly have been produced by accident. That was exactly what the Italian, uh, Italian GSV had observed uh, 200 years back. And thus was born the science of linguistics, comparative linguistics, historical linguistics, and linguistic paleontology over the last 100 years. Mm -hmm. And of course, with the advent of computer and artificial intelligence, right, the uh, understanding the evolution of languages and especially the you know the evolution of phonetics because language has mainly two things uh, one is the sound uh, and another is the structure and of course I mean I am oversimplifying the thing but um, like basically sound and structure that's how a language differentiates like uh, how Sanskrit become Bangla my I mean my mother tongue and Hindi and Pali and and Maithili and Odia or or even Punjabi or uh, Marathi, it's it's basically the sound changed. The structure almost remains same. Some some differences, right? But the study of the evolution of sound, uh, which plays a very big role in figuring out how the languages have evolved, and which is the which is the previous language and which is the minute language. Like now we know that Bangla came from Sanskrit. So if somebody says that Sanskrit came from Bangla, it would be, you know, I mean, ridiculous, right? But then, I mean, we know because we have a lot of historical records for that. But if you go three, four thousand years back, it was not possible, right? Because the records are not there. So uh, 
all these studies uh, it, it was kicked off by this william jones's uh, you know uh, like his observation and uh, i mean in the you know when uh, william jones wrote this thing right for for a very long time uh, you know people i mean suddenly realized that uh, the rigved was the oldest known human uh, you know oldest known book written by mankind in any language and initially people started believing that yes I mean, sanskrit could have been that mother language from which all the other indo european languages would have come come and then for a very long time people did believe that the uh, you know the indo european original indo european people might have come from uh, india so uh, the initial hysteria was huge like the romantic europe again you know found uh, i mean indian ancient indian texts in sanskrit very interesting and the, the astronomer francis bally english astronomer he claimed the brahmans are the teachers of pythagoras the instructors of greece and through her the whole of europe and voltaire the philosopher and you know multifaceted uh, you know multifaceted genius he told i am convinced that everything comes to us from the banks of ganges so if you see uh, it's little con- it's little uh, i mean different from uh, a general view that the indo european history or uh, this entire theory was uh, was perpetrated by the western people to demean indian culture and indian uh, you know uh, i mean civilization right but if you see at the beginning it was totally different and, but then how did sort of you know uh, all the controversies happen right so i, I will talk only on the linguistic side so over the next 100 years or so so there are a lot of uh, discoveries made uh, from linguistic point of view which which you know i mean made it very apparent that the other indo european languages could not have have evolved from sanskrit right so now uh, like who are the speakers and who migrated from where so that is outside the paradigm of this of this paper right so it is a pure analysis based on linguistic and very interestingly most of this you know uh, the uh, like the theories it come from paninis ashtadhyayi because he was the first grammarian of the world he made it very clear that sanskrit is a very homogeneous uniform language there is no exception in sanskrit like in, like you know in bangla we pronounce something but write something else right there is absolutely no ex- exception everything can be logically explained and panini did that but while people started studying panini and when they started you know comparing the grammar of other indo european languages they they figured out various anomalies and that was the beginning of the quest to you know find the chronology of the languages so we'll go through only three of them because the time is limited so when we talk about indo european languages so i'll just i have uh, i mean taken this thing uh, uh, like from this gam krelitz ivanov model which was proposed in the uh, in 1990s it's a temporal and spatial model spatial because it considers certain phonological uh you know similarities between uh, various languages from which it it, it is logical to uh, believe that actually the proto speakers of these languages should have stayed together before i mean disintegrating or or uh, moving out and temporal because it also considers the chronology of the evolution of the sounds you know uh, so uh, like uh, if you see here uh, it uh, the few of the languages like, like the anatolian language which is an extinct and has been extinct for more than 2000 years it is uh, the first language which could have or might have separated out from the you know uh, the proto indo european peoples and hittite which is one of the few anatolian languages which has which was discovered uh, more than 100 years back it, it it was spoken in anatolia which is uh, present turkey again uh, tokarian is another extinct language which was which was extinct some 1000 years back and was spoken uh, somewhere in xinjiang province in china and the tokarians are what uh, might be the people who are known as tukharas in atharva veda and also in ramayana and also tushara and the uh, you know the our heroic king kanishka of the kushans they are supposed to be the uh, predis are you know um, like uh, they I mean, they might have come from the the tukharas though the language of the kushanas were uh, different and interestingly uh, the tokarian language might be you know uh, geographically closest to sanskrit but they are if you see here they're clubbed with the you know celtic the latin italian french spanish uh, there are certain commonalities in in the tokarian language and and the celtic language is right so so that's the reason actually they, they are clubbed here and then of course uh, i mean sanskrit hindi bangla which is the indian languages and greek 
they again uh, form one group. So now uh, here is something interesting. So uh, the German linguist August Scleisha, I mean, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing the name uh, correctly because the bongs generally have I mean, horrible pronunciations in, in, in these things. So fine. So uh, Scleisha, he was the first person to attempt, you know, create the Proto-Indo-Korean language. And if you see, it, it sounded almost like Sanskrit. So there was a fable called the a sheep and the horses. And the first line of the fable was a sheep that had no wool or horses. So in Scleisha's reconstruction, it sounded like avis aquavas ka, and which is very similar to Vedic Sanskrit, which is avis ashwasas cha. And then the first line, a sheep had no that had no wool or horses. It, it sounded like avis jasmin varna na aast akvams dadarka in the proto indo uh, the constructed language and in vedic sanskrit it sounds like avis yasmin urna na asit aswans dadarsha so, you know so initially people felt that the proto language is almost sanskrit but then now the after 100 years of research right the proto indo european language sounds totally different so there are a lot of youtube videos you can see that i will try to like pronounce it so it sounds like Hois hekwas kwe, hoe yuas me yul nya ne hest so hekwams dar. So it has absolutely no phonologic. It apparently sounds, it doesn't sound like Sanskrit, right? So how it happened? And again, uh, I mean, Panini's Ashtadhai has has a lot of clues of why it happened. So just just a few uh, some of the you know terms in other in various ancient languages. If you see a ship. Uh, like you know the Vedic ship Avis he is always in Hellenic Greek and old Latin similarly Vedic Cha is Latin Kue and horses are Ashwasas in Vedas but Ekwai in both ancient Greek and Latin so in summary the A as in Avis or Ash Ashwasas uh, is becoming either O or E or A and then again Cha you know the like the Cha and the Sha sound in Sanskrit are often ka or you know, ka or q sound in other languages. So this, uh, you know, the a in Sanskrit uh, you know, becoming o or a in European languages. This is I mean something which was which is now known as the Brugman's law. We'll we'll come to that. And the cha sh in Sanskrit happening, you know, the ka in other European languages. This is uh, I mean called the law palatalization. We'll again uh, we'll we'll talk about these two things. So if you are uh, common uh, words across the you know indo european family so if you you know uh, what is interesting if you see chakra which is wheel in sanskrit uh, in hittite is it's kugula in greek it's kuklos we'll we'll again come to that right so you know if you see the cha and the ka sound uh, sorry the cha and the sha sounds were ka like again uh, shatam which is 100 used to be kentum in latin so in you know now we call it centum in latin but in in original latin pronunciation it, it used to be kentum and in greek it was caton and uh, so again same thing right the the k q sound you know becoming cha sha in sanskrit we'll uh, we'll we, we'll talk about these two things so now about the vowels so if the a uh, sound in sanskrit is a or o in other European languages, right? So, can it happen that, you know, uh, the original sound was A, A, and then, you know, the, the Germanic, the Latin, or the Greek might have evolved to or created the O and A sound from A? Most likely not. Again, Panini defines three vowels in, uh, in Sanskrit, A, E, and U. And then, the A and O sounds are compound vowels created you know, by combining the, the triad. So, A is A plus E and O is A and U. And if you see any sound evolution is always triggered by ease of articulation. That also Panini explains in a number of places, right? So, no compound sound, no, you know, uh, the compound sound cannot evolve from a simple sound. Like, so, you know, Panini himself made, uh, makes it very clear that the A sound cannot, would not have evolved from A. But the other way is possible because when you say A, Two, you know, uh, we'll come to that. So two parts of the mouth are used. It's little pronouncing sound like u or uh, sorry o or uh, a is little harder than pronouncing the simple vowel triads, right? 
so from th that point of view also right it's like it's very unlikely right because uh, panini explains a number of cases right so and again the sound evolution uh, always happens due to the ease of articulation no sound can evolve in any language which makes the sound complex right so uh, so this is the first first clue right where uh, like it comes from panini because he himself defines he he, de he defines two sounds that compound complex vowels right so now uh, now, uh, before going to you know uh, further analysis, right, we, uh, I mean uh, we should see how Panini uh, classifies the sounds in five vargas, right? Based on the uh, uh, you know place of articulation within the mouth. So the seven, eight, nine positions, which which are you know the backside of the mouth, they are uh, called kantha or the throat, and then palate is the talu, which is the top of the mouth, which is uh, you know position six. Uh, the, upper portion of the mouth and the and the front front part of uh, the talu is murdha right uh, so that is uh, you know like cerebral sounds come from murdha and then you know you have this uh, teeth uh, like the sounds which are created with te teeth and then lips so and then here is how panini defines or or categorizes the sounds so we have the vowel so for uh, pronouncing the vowel the tongue doesn't touch the mouth so and then we have the stops which is a consonant like uh, khaga. each of these sounds 25 sounds the tongue touches some part of the mouth so you close your vocal tract and the sound in a voice is uh, shut or stopped for a very small uh, a small portion of sound ka. so if you say your tongue will touch somewhere right so all the stops so that they are called stops and then we have the semi vowels ya ra la they're between the stops and the vowels, and then you have the sibilant, the sa sound, sa, sha, and the aspirate, which is a ha, right? So it's interesting if you see what Panini says here, right? The sound ka produced relatively back in the vocal tract is a guttural stop, lending its name to the first of the five vargas associated, associated with the simple vowel a. So, so, like, so all these sounds, the vowel a, the stops ka, ka, ga, ga, unga, and then the aspirate. H and the visarjaniya. What is visarjaniya? The hard and distinctly audible aspiration represented by two vertical dots, like shanti, shanti. So that that is also uh, it's called visarjaniya. And then uh, Panini uses a term akuho visarjaniya nang kantha. So which is the, the throat of the a, a, ka, ha, and visarjaniya. So first varga Panini calls akuho visarjaniya. Uh, you know, visit Janiya Nang Kanta is, is the place of articulation. So he, he uses an adjective for Kanta, and so uh, and then so the second varga, which which comes from Talu, uh, the second varga is named after Cha, the first of the five sounds produced by stopping or blocking a part of the oral cavity by touching the palate, the top of the mouth, with the front part of the tongue. And Panini's term for the place of articulation is Ichu Ichu Ya Shanang Talu. So he again sort of what it says. The palette of the four types of sounds, simple vowel E, the five consonants cha, cha, ja, ja, inga, semi vowel ya, and the sibilant sha. And for the vowel E, he uses the term a dvaita kantha. What it means, throat palate of two E's, two A's, which is A and I, right? So sort of we have uh, the A and I sound are related. So he so here he defines right that the A sound needs two places of articulation one is throat and palate correct now now come to let's see this one which is if you uh, you know uh, if you divide the mouth in two sections by an imaginary line drawn through, through uh, you know drawn through the center of the tongue then the you know the left side of the back side is your kantha or the guttural sounds and the front and and the rest of the sounds are are, are produced from the front so the ka sound is produced from the back and the a sound is produced from the back but the cha and a sound are produced from the front side now what happens uh, when you have a sound like k so k you have the ka sound and a compound vowel a so the ka sound is produced from the back of the of your mouth and the a sound is produced from the front of your mouth so when you say k so you know so you have to use both the kantha and the and the sort of uh, and, and the talu, right? So this a sound has a stimulus to simplify and you know push the sound place of articulation of the ka sound little little forward. 
so the moment the ka is shifted little forward it becomes cha because if you see here right like ka is produced from the back of the mouth and cha is produced from the front of the mouth the tongue instead of touching little back if little shifts to the front ka becomes cha so that is the point where you know the k the k sound has a tendency to become cha because again of the ease of articulation and the stimulus that a vowel is creating to push the place of articulation of ka little forward so the k sound could be palatalized to cha and sha because we saw the cha sha are again produced from the talu talavya uh, varga and uh, again uh, so here we can see something interesting like like say the uh, horse which is ashwa right the in latin it's called equus and in greek uh, okay greek i think uh, we can ignore that so and and the and the proto european form is equus right so here the uh, the qua qua sound right it 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 becomes schwa and again we we have seen that the a o sounds become you know simplified to a so equus become ashwa right if you just replace qua with schwa and a o with a you get ashwa and same thing uh, i think uh, kintam and shatam looks similar right uh, and again like arjun comes from the root uh, arg right again so arg becomes arj and from that you you get arjun right so again sort of ga becoming ja it is again like the ease of articulation it is it's called palatalization now uh, how does panini you know explain palatalization right so we will come to that so before that so you know uh, so panini uh, re refers to palatalization while explaining the formation of the word chakre so i would like to spend some time on this word chakre uh some because you know uh, i mean i couldn't hold myself from uh, doing this so chak one of the most glorified users of the word chakri is in the opening verse of medudam and i mean i'm so much Sir, obsessed with uh, we have two more two more minutes oh, oh, two more minutes okay oh, yeah. so uh, so i will i'll do one thing right so you know uh, i mean i will uh, i'll i mean make it little fast so uh, so chakra what uh, what panini says right so it's uh, the chakra is is uh, what we call uh, a uh, lit form of verb tree which is the you know past perfect form and in this in this form he, he you know the the root is reduplicated the kri you know the the, the root is kri and then you have another kri and then he says the kri becomes ka and the ka becomes cha so panini uses the term ka karas chakar the which is the you know the curse becoming cha right he doesn't explain why it happens right so this is actually he also refers to this right so what he means that the ka sound in is older than the cha sound and now if you if you now again go back to this one right if you see that greek latin and all these things have preserved an older sound so the cha is a evolved sound and any language which has which has preserved the ka sound is older right so again so this uh, this you know this makes it little apparent that uh the ka sound you know couldn't have come from cha right but it, it is other way around because panini himself defines and he he doesn't define uh, you know cha karas cha ka kar right which is uh, the the cha becoming ka roots uh, are are the form of cons consonant vowel consonant c v c like vak va a ka sad to sit sa a da so there are many you know uh, aberrations to that right like dha it is not it doesn't have this vowel consonant structure right so again in sanskrit i mean there cannot be any anomaly right everything is so uniform right so suddenly why few roots are are uh, differing from this cvc structure right so uh, i mean i will just make it short i will not go into details right but that's where in 1878 swiss linguist frederick de sasur he proposed that no like the original you know the forms was not dha but it was dhe he proposed a theory of uh, of eight sounding laryngeals right so which which he told that it might have got you know extinct in sanskrit because as per the old uh, you know the linguist right there cannot be any uniformity in sanskrit right you know in the roots it has to be consonant vowel consonant or something like that right and in and he told this in 1878 and in the 1920s the hittite language was discovered right where they actually figured out that that missing h in sanskrit and in other languages right was there right so um, i think with that i will end uh, 
uh, that uh, you know there are we, we just talked about three of the things which mainly comes from panin ashtadhyay where panin is somehow either he doesn't explain or or might be ignored it but from his uh, observation only it it becomes quite apparent that the uh, you know purely based on the phonological changes and the science of phonetics uh I mean, Sanskrit must have evolved from another older language. What is that language that we still don't know? But now we have we know the Hittite is the oldest known Indo-European like, languages, which preserves some of the very archaic, older forms from which Sanskrit would have evolved. 